Thank you everybody for joining tonight. We are so excited to have you all here and we are so grateful um, for everybody who made this event happen and everybody who is uh, able to make it tonight. Um, let's see, I, I just pull up my notes real quick. So I'm Avalon Gupta Verweeby. I am the equity and inclusion organizer with SAFSA, um, which is the Syracuse Onondaga Food Systems Alliance. I am also a graduate, graduate student fellow with the Lender Center for Social Justice. Um, and let's see. I'm wondering if there is a way to well, can you all see the, the slides still or my notes? We've got your slides, Evelyn. Okay, awesome, great. <laughs> uh, so the uh, uh, SAFSA and the Lender Center are the two organizations co-hosting this event tonight. SAFSA is a network of food system stakeholders and a catalyst for change based in Syracuse, New York, surrounding Onondaga County and the neighboring Onondaga Excuse Nation. Excuse me. I see the four pictures of these young ladies. It says health beyond weight and food justice. That's what's okay. on my screen. Awesome, thank you, Mabel. That is what I was hoping you all could see right now. <laughs> um, so I was just gonna introduce SAFSA and the Lender Center. The Lender Center is a Syracuse University Center promoting multidisciplinary and dynamic collaborations that support the development of courageous and ethical scholars and citizens who are committed to practices of social justice. This event is going to consist of a roughly one hour long panel moderated by Professor Harriet Brown, who I'll introduce in a minute. The panel will then be followed by breakout room sessions where we will discuss what the panel sparked for us. After those breakout rooms, we will return to the main group for some audience Q and A with the panelists. Um, and this event will be recorded and posted to SAFSA's YouTube page. So if you have to leave at some point, uh, we'll, we will be sending that out via our newsletter and posting it on our social media so you can find it that way later on. Uh, just real quick, some housekeeping. Maura Ackerman, who's the facilitator for SAFSA, is our tech support for the night. She's going to change her name to Maura Ackerman Tech Support. And if you're having technical issues, please chat her. We also know that this is a big topic with the potential to generate an emotional response. And so Sarah Bennett, a social work grad student, will be our emotional support tonight. And if you want to step aside and do some grounding exercises, you can message Sarah, whose name is changed to Sarah Bennett Emotional Support, or you can message Maura to be put in a breakout room together. And Lucia and Maggie are, are our ASL interpreters for tonight. And they are both named Lucia and Maggie ASL interpretation, and they should be spotlighted throughout. Um, please remain muted with your video off for the duration of the panel. Um, and then once you're in your breakout rooms, please feel free to turn your cameras back on and unmute yourself. And if you would like to be assigned to a breakout room with ASL interpretation, please message Maura, or you can reach out to the ASL interpreters who will, they'll communicate together. So uh, let's see. Um, so with that, I wanted to start this off with a land acknowledgement. Um, a land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes the unique and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. I want to acknowledge that the land we know as Onondaga County sits on traditional Haudenosaunee territory. And I also wanna honor our neighbors, the Onondaga Nation, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. And so I wanna now introduce our moderator, Professor Harriet Brown, who will then introduce our three panelists and we'll get into it. Harriet Brown is a professor of magazine, news, and digital journalism at the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications and a sought-after speaker on colleges, college campuses around the country. 
She has written for the New York Times Science Section, the New York Times Magazine, O Magazine, Psychology Today, Scientific American, and other publications. Her most recent book is Shadow Daughter, a Memoir of Estrangement. She has also written Body of Truth, How Science, History, and Culture Drive Our Obsession with Weight and What We Can Do About It, and Brave Girl Eating, A Family Struggle with Anorexia, which won a Books for Better Life Award. In 2011, she won the University of Iowa's John F. Murray Prize in Strategic Communications for the Public Good for her work as an advocate for those with eating disorders. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and Professor Brown, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Avalon. Um, hello, everyone. I'm really delighted to introduce our three panelists here, uh, beginning with Kimmy Singh, who is a self-proclaimed fat registered dietitian based in New York City. She is the owner of Body Honor Nutrition, a nutrition private practice that supports individuals to heal their relationships with food and body. Kimmy supports her clients with a fat positive and anti-oppressive framework and has a special passion for working with people that have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Kimmy is also a sought after speaker and has presented at several national conferences. She presents the effects of anti-fat stigma in healthcare and nutrition. Kimmy is a believer in kindness, compassion, and the power of advocacy. You can learn more about her at www.bodyhonornutrition.com. Next, we have Holly Lowry Davis, who is the Chief Operating Officer for Ophelia's Place, a local nonprofit with a mission of, prof of providing support and facilitating healing for everybody impacted by eating disorders, diet culture, and body oppression, which is pretty much everyone, right? Through her work with Ophelia's Place, she endeavors to bring a justice lens into the eating disorders field, working to center the needs of the most marginalized in order to create a ripple effect of healing for all. Holly has also worked one-to-one -one as a coach, in addition to having served as a consultant and support group facilitator for the Upstate New York Eating Disorder Service, working to educate and support individuals and families through the process of recovery and body liberation. And just as a side note, I've uh, done some work with Ophelia's Place, and it's a really fantastic nonprofit and uh, place. So if you, if you don't know about them, check them out. And finally, we have Mikey Mercedes, or Marquisel Mercedes, who is a fat liberationist writer, creator, educator, and doctoral student from the Bronx, New York. As a presidential fellow at the Brown University School of Public Health, Mikey explores how racism, anti-blackness, and fat phobia have collided to shape healthcare, research, promotion, and training through the lenses of stigma, fat studies, and critical public health studies. Mikey's public-facing work often blends academic scholarship, personal narratives, and liberationist politics to craft incisive critiques of fat phobia and racism in the sciences, culture, and society. Alongside a group of incredible fat activists, she's also a co-host of the podcast Unsolicited, Fatties Talk Back, which re-answers old advice columns from fat activist perspectives that realize the multi-faced intersectional span of the lived fat experience. Mikey has been featured in outlets like the Washington Post, Gizmodo, and Popular Science, and speaks regularly at events and organizations like the UK-based Appearance Matters Conference, Food Share Toronto, and Weight Inclusive Dietitians in Canada. So welcome to all our panelists, as well as to our audience and the organizers of this great event. So yeah, we're going to dive right in here. Um, and my first question to the panelists is, you know, could you give us a brief definition of what weight stigma is, what that means to you? Um, because it's a term we kind of throw around, but let's let's know what we're talk all talking about. And, um, you know, I could call on people or you could just dive right in. I'm all for the dive right in school of uh, panel moderation. But don't forget to unmute yourself, panelists. I'd be glad to dive in, unless somebody else was. It's so hard to tell. 
on these virtual <laughs> virtual ones. So yeah, you know, I usually describe it as like the societal disapproval of existing in a body perceived to have too much fat. And it's so important to consider just the fact that like what too much is really differs depending on your culture, your subculture. Like, yeah, so yeah, just a lot of considerations. And by culture, I don't just mean like maybe your ethnicity, but also I'm thinking like communities that you might belong in, like in, yeah, different LGBTQ plus communities. I know my family is South Asian. So what's considered too fat in South Asia is very different from here in the States. And even in the States, there's, yeah, so many different ideas. Um, but something I just like to highlight is that it is really different from maybe like discomfort that people might experience towards folks that are thin. And so it's really um, a form of like anti-fatness and yeah. So I hope that makes sense. Thanks, Kimmy. Uh, I'll jump. Oh, oh, you, you go, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. <laughs> um, okay, I'll dig in. So I want to echo um, what Kimmy said, that distinction I think is really important around um, this being different than attitudes that thin, thin folks might experience or folks in the eating disorders field. I think a lot of times um, that comes up in, in our conversations too, is like perhaps the shame that they feel in their body, even though they may be straight sized. Those are, those are valid, but two totally different things. Um, and so, yeah, I think for me, um, my sort of operating definition often just comes back to like the attitudes and beliefs um, and actions that perpetuate shame, discrimination, and oppression based on the size of one's body. Um, and that that happens at an individual level as well as like an institutional and a systemic level. Um, so, you know, of course today we're talking about healthcare and, and exploring, um, that more at like the institutional and systemic level, but um, yeah, it's it's all interconnected, which I'm sure we'll get into. So I'll pass the mic to Mikey. Yeah, I think I love this emphasis on the differentiation between, you know, the negative attitudes that thin people might feel towards their bodies versus the social, cultural, and structural discrimination that fat people face on the basis of fat phobia. You know, um, the term weight stigma is really tricky because we use, we say weight stigma when we really mean fat phobia and the manifestations of fat phobia. Um, and so you might see people say weight stigma, you might see people say fat stigma. There's a certain subset of researchers that use the term obesity stigma quotes, heavy quotes around obesity, because that is the medicalized um, concept of fatness, the medicalization, pathologization of body diversity and body size. Um, and so, yeah, you might hear all kinds of terms. Some people just say fat phobia or fat mesia. I tend to say fat phobia in order to sort of describe the very wide range of ways that hatred and denigration of fatness exists and manifests. Um, and so when we say like fat stigma in general, um, it's the association of fatness, fat people and fat bodies to negative characteristics and connotations. And so when someone is stigmatized, they're experiencing either the internal or external or both effects of that stigma. And that can take form in weight discrimination um, that like we often talk about like through delay of medical care and medical fat phobia, or it could be something um, like lack of social belonging and isolation. And so it, it takes lots of different kinds of forms, but yeah. Oh, thank you to all of you. Um, I think one really important thing to note about whatever we call this, let's call it fat phobia for now, um, you know, is that it has personal and political slash systemic uh, manifestations. And I think that, um, I think the personal we're probably all aware of on some level. I think our focus tonight, although not exclusively, is going to be on looking at some of the uh, systemic effects of this kind of stigma, hatred, phobia, although certainly we have plenty of room to talk about the personal as that comes up as well. So uh, Mikey, you're up. Let's just stick with you for a minute um, because here's the next big question, which is uh, how does fat phobia and weight stigma, how do they impact healthcare? 
And that is an enormous question that you could choose to answer anywhere on that spectrum, right? <laughs> so go for it. Oh, wow. Okay. So this is one of my favorite questions because when someone asks me how weight stigma impacts healthcare, I always get to turn it around on them. Like the thing that I think people misunderstand when they first start to learn about fat phobia or, or weight stigma, whatever you call it. Um, you know, when we talk about healthcare, we're like, oh, doctors are people that live in a fat phobic. And I'm saying doctors just for like convenience. Obviously, this is not specific to physicians. Um, but we're like, oh, doctors are people that live in a fat phobic society. And then they take those attitudes and they become part of their practice, right? Um, and to an extent, that's not exactly incorrect. It's, but it's a small part of the bigger picture. Like, we don't really talk about the fact that fat phobia is literally an invention of science. <laughs> like, as in it is imparsible from the ways we understand bodies scientifically and medically. And so I always like to say that weight stigma doesn't necessarily impact healthcare. It's more that science, including medical, biomedical, um, and you know, related areas of science created weight stigma. And medicine is medicine and healthcare are one of the main mechanisms through which that operates. Um, and so fat phobia is inherent to, to healthcare. It's it shapes everything from how we the certain forms of information that we teach, practicing or training um, medical professionals. And then there's also the attitude piece that you know people who are practitioners bring with them, but that is reinforced by um, the way that fat phobia has shaped which bodies are seen as sick and which bodies are not, and which bodies are seen as valuable and which bodies are not. Um, and so it, they're so closely tied together that I think putting the arrow from like weight stigma to healthcare as it's like a one, like one way sort of thing is like an incomplete picture. Um, but I mean, there are, if we're talking about like the nitty gritty, there's the fact that like doctors provide less patient centered care. They, <laughs> they often apply incredibly incorrect and unscientifically founded, um, ideas of weight and health to restrict and police the bodies of fat people. Um, fatness is used as a justification for delaying and denying care. Um, and it's also, um, you know, a very clear axis of criminalization too. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately of how fatness interacts with things like mental illness, especially eating disorders, and thinking about the ways in which like, especially black fat folks are barred from certain forms of care because of the ways their fatness allows them to be criminalized in ways that are not compatible with the sympathies that we're supposed to give people who have like eating disorders, for example. Could you give it's, an example it's of very that? very complex. Well, yeah, yeah. So that? like, mm -hmm. so for example, I'll pull from my own experiences. The first time that I approached a physician about my disordered eating was when I was 10. Um, and I noted that I was having extreme anxiety around dinner time, that it gave me anxiety to think of eating, especially eating in front of other people. Um, and instead of Instead of diving into that very clear eating disorder related uh, behavior, my doctor told me that I was building willpower and, <laughs> and I was learning discipline. And that is the kind of response that would not be part of somebody's experience who is not fat and not black and not poor and also not experiencing certain forms of care. Um, so yeah, that's an example. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's horrifying. Um, yeah. <laughs> and when you were talking about like, uh, you know, fatness can be an, ex uh, a, a reason, an excuse to deny, deny or delay care. I was thinking about the fact that, uh, 
um, I was thinking about some, some of my own experience too, which was I was turned down by a doctor to do a knee replacement until I lost weight. And, you know, but of course you could always go have weight loss surgery. And I was thinking, okay, so what is the rationale? If, if there's a health concern about anesthesia, if you're fat, how can I, how could you then turn around and recommend, you know, uh, gastric bypass, which also requires anesthesia? It's very clear that it's not an issue of that. Anyway, thank you. Let's move on to um, maybe Kimmy. You want to take this a little bit further? Uh, how does weight stigma, fat phobia affect healthcare? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oof. It's such a tough one. And I feel it like as a fat healthcare provider, like just, yeah, in so many ways. But I, I think what for me feels most concerning, similar to what Mikey mentioned is that you don't just have people that have these biases. You all, you just have this entire system, like their entire training process really perpetuates fat phobia. And oftentimes they aren't given um, cases to discuss outside for around fat bodies outside of, oh, this person just needs to lose weight or their tools are not tested. Medical tools are not necessarily tested on folks that are fat. They're just tested on folks that are straight sized. Um, they're not, even like with operating surgery, they're not given um, cadavers that are fat. Like there are so many really concerning things here about how that really dangerous fat folks. And so when we even consider adverse outcomes to surgery as a whole, we're not talking about the fact that, yeah, doctors aren't trained to support fat folks and that's so dangerous. And so I, I guess like what for me feels really concerning is the fact that we're not even having these critical conversations amongst healthcare providers. And yeah, it's just la lazy medicine. I feel like it's, yeah, just really unfortunate that weight gets blamed for everything that comes up. And doctors, not only do they fail to recognize how fat phobic, how, how fat phobia shows up, but, but really just how they're not trained to support fat folks as a whole. Thank you, yeah. yeah. And Holly, would you like to tackle this one? Sure. Yeah. So I think um, one of the things that sort of came up for me as um, Mikey was talking is I think a lot of times in medicine, um, and I mean, really, if we zoom out, I think sort of collectively in our culture, we're very individualistic, right? And so I think that that's reinforced at the doctor's office a lot of times, or if you're fat, it's your fault. <laughs> You've done something wrong. Um, and you see that from the moment you walk in the doctor's office and there's the BMI poster on the wall and you just know what conversation is coming, right? Um, and so, right, it kind of shifts this, it, it creates this idea that you are the problem and thus it's your responsibility to fix it rather than really looking at like what are the systemic and cultural and sort of communal um, components that, that might be influencing not this person's weight necessarily, but this person's health and how they're feeling and their access to food um, and really beginning to look at like what are um, the things that not just this person can do as an individual, of course, there are health promoting behaviors we can engage in if we choose to do so, um, but how can we support this person in, in getting uh, more communal care? Uh, because overall, that's gonna, that's gonna make a huge, a, a bigger dent in my opinion, a lot of times than the focus on the individual piece. Um, and then something that Kimmy was saying too, is, you know, you, you I say this, you, because as a straight sized person, I haven't personally experienced this, but in the work that I do, the clients I've worked with, um, and the, the sort of knowledge I have from being in this field for a while, um, is not only does a fat person experience that, that shame, that stigma, the bias, the, the lack of care, the denial of care at the doctor's office, when they leave, they're experiencing that in, in basic, virtually all other arenas, right? And so it's this constant reinforcement, um, and so it doesn't just end when you leave the doctor's office, take that deep breath and, th you know, it'd be easy to think like, okay, it ends here. I could like put that, uh, put that away and like move on with my life, but it doesn't because it's reinforced at every sort of um, turn outside of the doctor's office as well. Right. Healthcare is one of the systems that teaches us and reinforces it and, and hammers it into us. Um, good, thank you. And Holly, maybe I'll we'll start with you for the next question. And by the way, panelists, if you want to like talk to each other too, that's that's totally kosher. So I, I don't need to run the whole show here. Um, but so our next question is: so we've you know we're, we we kind of have defined fat phobia, weight stigma. We've talked a little bit about how it affects healthcare. 
How does it connect with issues of food justice, you know, especially issues like food insecurity, equitable access to food, uh, food literacy? Um, and I think I might add to that just, you know, we have these associations in this culture between um, weight and socioeconomic class that are deeply ingrained. So, yeah, uh, take that away, Holly. Sure. Um, well, there are a lot of ways that it influences um, that, that weight stigma and fat phobia influence um, food justice, access to food. Um, one of the things that that I think about a lot of times or that I'm learning about and hearing more about is like, um, I, I grew up understanding that certain foods are healthy and certain foods are not based on my culture, right? The groups that I grew up in exposed to mostly white, right? And so my ideas about health growing up were rooted in white supremacy and what foods were helpful were rooted in white supremacy, right? And so a lot of times for a, a black person or a person of color who enters the doctor's office and they're you know, getting the whole spiel of, you're overweight, here are the things you can do to lose weight, here are the, you know, basically dietary recommendations. Um, there's no acknowledgement most of the time of the traditions, the practices of that person's culture and how that is probably going to different from be different from my culture's ideas of not only what foods are healthy, but what foods taste good, what foods um, feel connected to my heritage, my lineage, right? And so that in and of itself teaches, um, it sort of creates this, uh, I guess, for lack of better words, like this tearing, this conflict inside um, of what should I be eating, um, but what foods feel good to me, what foods taste good to me, um, and and how do I actually take care of myself? Because there's so much information or misinformation, rather, about what foods are healthful um, and what what foods we should or shouldn't be eating. Um, and that that idea of what we should or shouldn't be eating, and I'm sure Kimmy can speak to this far uh, more eloquently than I can, is has a huge ripple effect on our mental state, um, as well as physiologically, metabolically, how our body responds to food and food scarcity, um, because it's not just you know, the, it's not just in access to food, which has a huge impact on our relationship with food, um, as well as uh, like our, our metabolic function um, and our brain chemistry, but even just the idea that we should or shouldn't be eating certain foods um, has a huge impact on all of that as well. Actually, interestingly, there was a study done back in 1973 um, with, with two different groups of women, S Swedish women and Thai women. And uh, I, I don't even know, remember why they were doing the study, but basically they, they did all sorts of things, including uh, feeding the Swedish women Thai food, and this was back in 1973 in the U.S., so, you know, most non-Thai people weren't eating Thai food, and feeding the Thai women Swedish food, and they actually fascinatingly determined that your body can make better use of the nutrition in food when it's something that you like and, you know, like are accustomed to eating, basically. So that kind of supports the idea that, yes, the kinds of foods that you are used to eating, um, you know, they matter to you, not just, they matter on all levels, emotionally, psychologically, but also physically and perhaps in terms of nutrition. So fascinating. Like, yes, can I add to that? It's really interesting. Jimmy. So I think, I forget when you said that study was from, did you say it was from the 90s? Is that right? It was 73 actually. Oh my gosh. Okay. So a hot topic in research these days is like the gut microbiome, like the bacteria in our gut. And so I don't think it was really very well studied back then, but what we're seeing is that um, folks of different like ethnic and racial groups have a different gut microbiome makeup depending on what food they eat. And so it's really interesting because it just sort of shows how your body physically responds differently to foods that, yeah, your body might be better at digesting. Yeah, that's real. That, of course, that makes perfect sense that that would be one of the mechanisms that's probably at play there. Um, so Kimmy, you know, uh, you know, could you talk a little bit about how issues of weight stigma connect with issues of food insecurity, uh, yeah. food justice and literacy? Absolutely. So the first thing that comes to mind is something that both fat folks experience and people that experience food insecure also sort of go through in, it, 
it's really this like being infantilized at the hands of folks that maybe are supporting them or saying that they're supporting them. And so to be a fat person that's also facing insecure, uh, food insecurity, um, there's just sort of this assumption that you don't really have much health literacy or you don't know what your body needs. And so it's just this idea that like, oh, we need to help this poor person. And yeah, so it's just something that, um, I feel like body autonomy is a really big and important piece that we don't get to talk about enough when it comes to, yeah, this intersection. And um, it's, yeah, I see it a lot, especially when we're having these discussions, like amongst, you know, those of us who don't have this experience, oftentimes those that are experiencing it are kind of left, uh, yeah, out of the conversation. And yeah, it just, it makes it much more difficult to really serve this community. So what you're really talking about then is how issues of racism and classism intersect with fat phobia, which yeah. they're inextricable from, really. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and I think sometimes um, there's just this idea that if we can give this person maybe like to improve their food access, we can fix their entire life or it'll solve X, Y, Z. But I wonder what they actually want, right? Like, I wonder, um, yeah, what these, what these folks might feel like would help meet their needs. Well, and embedded in that, embedded in that is the assumption that uh, it's because people don't know, so they're ignorant. It's because they're poor. Mm -hmm. um, that's why they're fat. Whereas exactly. one of the interesting things um, that we are now beginning to talk about is perhaps people are poor because they're fat, not fat because they're poor right? Poverty in and of itself uh, and all of the things that come with it can, you know, what is the link? Like we, we assume this sort of one way link and uh, that ignores so many other things. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's also really, it can be really confusing. Uh, I don't even know if confusing is the right word, but complex to discuss because in some parts of the world, fatness will represent wealth and greed and like overconsumption. And then here in the States, um, sort of like being fat and food insecure is just seen as a very different thing. So, yeah. Mikey, wanna jump in? Yeah, um, so many thoughts I have. So whenever I think about how fat phobia sort of collides with food inequity or food insecurity um I go like the the history route like throwing it way back um I I started reading recently um a really fascinating book from Amanda Logan called The Scarcity Slot um excavating histories of food security in Ghana and for me, when I think of how fat phobia and weight stigma are intertwined, this book is a really great resource because it talks about how colonialism and conquest and white imperialism basically manufactured and created food insecurity <laughs> on like specifically on the African continent. And so when I think about how white supremacy and imperialism and colonialism is also what gave rise to fat phobia then we can see how these two things are the same thing um and in thinking about that um i think that a lot of the ways in which our current food systems especially in the u.s and i say in the u.s lightly because it's clear that a lot of um especially our food manufacturing relies on pillaging the land and homes of people in foreign countries. Um, <laughs> when I think about that, and I think about how colonialism inherently changed our relationship to food with things like market-based economies and cash cropping, then we sort of understand how like whiteness is what pushed us away and distanced us from the production of our food, from the means of manufacturing our own food, from our relationship to the land. And um, I think that food, food deserts or food inequity are just things that sort of stem from this, from the, from the bigger history of how colonialism wrecked our world. Um, and also 
I, I tend to look at things like food insecurity or food literacy very different. I think food literacy in general um, is something that if I'm being completely honest and, and saying this bluntly, like I don't think it's something that our health research apparatus should be investing any kind of thing in and promoting. People know how to eat. The thing is people know how to eat. What they need is food. They need food that fits their lifestyle. They need food that makes sense to them and they need food that they want to eat. Um, I know that there's a lot of demonization specifically of like classically unhealthy foods with in movements for food justice, that kind of food moralization that says, yeah, we want people to have access to all foods, but not, not, not all foods, like just the foods that we want them to be eating. And so that's this extension of white paternalism um, that was again, first started through colonialism, conquest, imperialism, et cetera. Um, and so I think that the most important thing for food justice, especially when we're thinking about how we can best support people through the health risks that capitalism specifically poses to them, it's important that we give them food that actually makes sense. Food isn't accessible just because you have it. Food is accessible because it fits your life. And so that brings things in like the importance of quote unquote processed foods, of frozen foods, of shelf stable foods, foods that usually we don't want poor people eating because we think that that's the thing that makes their lives horrible, that they're, they're poor and so they can't manage their money. And so they buy foods laden with preservatives and additives and blah, blah, blah. It's just an extension of classism and food moralization. Um, at the end of the day, people need to eat. That's the most important thing. And I think until we actually tackle that and make sure that people have food, the conversation about people discerning which foods are most nutritionally dense is like really irrelevant. Um, it doesn't actually matter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's sort of the equivalent of like going up to someone who is displaced and houseless and being like, you shouldn't be eating that bag of chips. You should really be eating like a salad. Like it doesn't actually make any sense and it doesn't actually help anyone. It's just a way for us to police and further shame and also justify the inequalities that exist because individualization works in a way that allows us to work on small little problems and small little fixes mm -hmm. instead of actually focusing on the broader system, which is that companies should not be allowed to ravage foreign lands. They shouldn't be allowed to abuse and exploit workers. They shouldn't be allowed to get away with poor, dangerous working conditions. And those are the things that really kill people when it comes to food and our relationship to food, not when they decide to like have a packet of snack cakes. Yeah, food <laughs> so that's the way. Kind of yeah. It comes into that whole personal responsibility conversation, right? Which we Absolutely. are very fond of in this country. And also, yes. this all makes me think of like Michael Pollan and his, you know, rules for eating, because mm. to me, they sort of embody, you know, which is what we're going to get into next. They embody this sort of, you know, earnest paternalistic perspective of, you know, I'm going to tell you, you don't know how to eat. So I'm going to tell you how to eat, eat food, eat plant food that is based in plants, but not too much, not too much. Mm -hmm. You cannot, <laughs> part of that is you cannot trust yourself and your body to tell you what you need and how much of it that you need, you know, sort of to your point, Kimmy. Yeah. Can I add to like, what I find in my work is that there's so much overlap between the way folks think about food and the way folks think about money. And so this idea that like, oh, these people can't be trusted to eat what's right for them, or they can't be trusted to manage their own finances. When in reality, folks are both not given enough money because of capitalism that also not given enough um, yeah, resources to have food. And I, I feel like something that Mikey reminded me of is sort of what I discuss with clients, like the, we call it sort of like the hierarchy of food needs. And so even if we're discussing like food to manage a chronic disease or disease prevention, it's so, so, so far beyond like having enough food, having culturally relevant food, having a variety of food and all of these other needs that are much more important than even considering like 
How do we prevent I don't know, whatever disease? What, especially considering the fact that food is only one small component of many things that impact overall health. But for some reason, people tend to fixate on it. And yeah, there's just so much, such a connection between like, yeah, pleasure and food and, and what's seen as indulgence and that, and yeah, a lot there. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think also to your point, like this conversation about food and eating and how people eat often sort of um, centers around this idea of health, but I personally don't think it's really about health much of the time, because I think if we were really talking about health, we'd be having a different conversation. I think it's about a lot of the things that we've already mentioned. So it's about white supremacy. It's about, you know, othering. It's about, um, you know, uh, it's about maintaining a certain kind of social identity, which involves I'm better than you. And therefore I have to sort of look at you in this particular way and treat you in this particular way. So, um, well, let's go to the next question, because I think that's going to get a little stickier here, which is, you know, we've we've touched on this reality that I'm sure we've all experienced that, you know, if you try to sort of bridge this gap between healthcare professionals and food justice advocates, um, you know, in working with communities like like let's say, you know, communities that, that experience a lot of food insecurity and uh, lack of access to food and all of the other sort of um, issues that come with socioeconomic class in this country, you know, they often wind up reinforcing fat phobia uh, intentionally or not, right? In some of the ways that we've been talking about. And given that we're not going to end capitalism anytime soon, um, how do we, how do we get folks to talk to each other in ways that are going to be more productive? You know, how do we bring these groups together to talk about food justice and healthcare in ways that don't perpetuate, you know, systems of oppression around bodies? Um, Holly, do you want to jump in first on this one? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'll take the obvious answer. And I think of one of the first steps is being a part of more spaces like this um, and being willing to like dedicate the, the time and energy. Um, you know, one of the things that came up in the workshop we did last week was like, you know, the use of weight as a marker for health has become quick and easy. Right. Um, and I, I don't say that as a knock to physicians, I say that to sort of um, invite folks to really look at like, why am I using that as a marker for health and why am I dedicating um, so much time and energy to like making that a discussion point in the conversations I have with my clients. Um, and then as as part of that next step or um, another thing I think that we can be doing to start to have these conversations and bridge that gap is asking more questions, right? Um, I know that, you know, you only have so much time when you're with a provider, um, but I know for me, and this is, again, as a straight size person, I often get talked at. <laughs> um, and so imagine all of those dynamics we just talked about, if you're a fat person experiencing that paternalism, um, the anti-fat attitudes, um, and how, and that, that level of supremacy. Um, I can imagine the sort of talking app versus questions um, grows even more so, right? And so um, I think it's pausing to, to really ask more questions about what somebody's experiencing. How are they feeling? Um, rather than assuming how they're feeling or rather than assuming they want to lose weight or rather than assuming they're eating unhealthy, whatever that means, right? Um, and that could even lead to looking at like, what, um, how do I, as a professional, as a physician, et cetera, um, how do I define health? Um, and how does ableism show up in my definition of health? And how does classism show up in my definition of health? And really starting to dissect, um, dissect that and look at like, how has our idea of health um, been sort of warped by these systems of oppression? And can we, is there a way to strip that back and truly make it about care? Um, again, at that individual and communal level. Thank you. Who wants to dive in next? I, is it okay, Kimmy, if I go ahead? Okay, cool. So <laughs> I have so many feelings about this. I have feelings about a lot of things, <laughs> if that isn't clear. That is so great. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so um, 
so I specifically in my PhD program, I study a lot of things, as you may have heard in my bio, but, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, I focus specifically on weight stigma in healthcare. And so that I tend, I tend to think of that as my biggest area of expertise. And so that means I speak to a lot of people who are healthcare professionals, are students that are hoping to become healthcare professionals. And something that I think is so incredibly important, and this is something that I'm going to be covering in a piece I have coming out in April with Pipe Branch Magazine, is um, we need to redefine who the experts are. Doctors specifically don't actually know that much about nutrition in the first place. And so, like less than 20% of med medical schools have a single required course on nutrition. As far as I'm concerned, and this is something that my, that my friend and fellow fat activist and just brilliant overall person, Monica Creedy says a lot, is that a lot of the things that physicians specifically know about healthcare are like as scientifically rigorous as what you might find in like a Cosmopolitan magazine. Like it's not based in pretty much anything, but true truisms that have been repeated, reaffirmed, and sort of um, reinforced over time. And uh, so a lot of healthcare professionals are not experts on nutrition. And so I want to make that very, very clear. People who study nutrition, um, who deeply critically studied nutrition are the only people who should really be informing our scientific understandings of what we should be eating. And I use that term obviously very loosely um, because I don't actually think that anyone has a requirement to eat what other people think they should be eating. Um, especially not someone who literally has no idea what they're talking about with regards to food. Um, and so <laughs> And so then there's also food justice advocates where this is like a very often homogenous group of people who food justice advocates often don't come from the communities they work with. Um, it's, it's a very white savior complex area. Um, and they have very simplistic ideas about the impacts that food can have on health, especially within the context of capitalism. Um, something that frustrates me a lot about food justice activists is that they think that if they just like focus on the issue of food, that that'll like suddenly fix all of the health disparities in the communities that again, they're often not part of. And that's one incredibly wrong as we discussed, because food again, is just a small part of our overall well-being. And two, it actually operates on a lot of stigmatizing assumptions about the people they're working with and stigmatizing assumptions about what people should and should be doing. And so when we have these two groups converge together, it should really only be done on the grounds that are set by the people that they're supposedly serving. <laughs> Um, I don't really have any interest in what healthcare professionals or food justice advocates have to say about food disparities between communities, unless that conversation is community led. Um, I also don't have any interest in hearing what these groups have to say, unless they are committed to providing material resources in order to amend these, these disparities, not, not food education, not demonstrations, not short stopgap measures, material supports, things like supporting co-op community run grocery stores, buying land, teaching people how to do agriculture, in ways that are community specific and relevant. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so there's oh, all oh. these other things that need to be done in order for these two, the two groups opinions to even matter in the first place. So uh, that makes me think about um, the issue of community gardens, which, you know, here in Syracuse, that's something that, um, you know, there, there is a pretty strong network of community gardens that is connected and other people in this zoom know more about it than I do but um you know that that are sort of connected to a food justice you know so so can you talk about that a little bit like what do you what do you think about that as an example of material supports 
I think that in a lot of, especially um, more urban type places, community gardens are really great. Um, they're not exactly like, I mean, anybody who's run a garden knows that in order to be able to sustain and have several meals from a garden, that's like a lot of work. Yeah. Um, and so that's the reasons why like the solutions that we propose have to be community relevant and contextually specific because like people have different relations, people have different access to land. Mm -hmm. um, even when we're thinking about how we might provide more community ownership over land that can be used for growing food or, or making community garden, like that just might not be possible in certain places. And so that's why it's important to have like a very wide range of interventions. And that's why I'm like a really big fan of grocery co-ops because the best way to get people invested in a solution to food insecurity in their community is to make sure they're actually involved and they have a stake. And there's just like a lot of other things we can be doing besides just going into communities and handing out pamphlets that are like nice shamey. <laughs> <laughs> Like your protein should be the size of your fist, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, like anyway. instead of eating white rice, have you considered quinoa? And it's like, yeah. shut up. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> Actually, they have considered quinoa because quinoa is not a new food, and it's a it's a food that's very culturally specific for a lot of people before white people decided it was interesting. Mm -hmm. And so, and this is like an example of what I'm talking about. I don't think that healthcare professionals or food justice advocates have a real understanding of the stakes involved in the interventions they have. Like for them, the difference might be whether or not they have a good metric to report for a grant application. For the community, it's about whether or not they're eating dinner that night. And so like, mm -hmm. that's what I mean when I say like these two groups food justice advocates or healthcare professionals are just not the people that should be leading these conversations hmm. at all. Thank you. Kimmy, you wanna, wanna weigh in on this? Yeah, I feel like it kind of goes back to my other point of just how infantilizing those two communities can be and how we just have two groups of folks that think that they're the experts on people's bodies and on what people's needs are. And in reality, both groups are terribly uninformed and misinformed about weight, health, BMI, food needs. And yeah, and it's like, even like with my work, I would completely agree with Mikey that like, unless you're actually in these communities, you really don't know what these communities need. And I feel like with community gardens and fat, a lot of fat folks needs, I feel like a lot of things like mobility issues are not taken into consideration when setting up these community gardens with some of the like culinary groups. I know with dietitians, they'll come in and try to teach like healthy recipes. I wonder how even like having culinary groups that just like taught some fun cooking stuff that people wanted to learn in that community could be a really great alternative. Um, yeah, and really just asking folks like, what would you like instead of maybe if someone says like, oh, I wanna learn how to make French fries. Um, instead of interpreting that as like, oh, I'll teach you how to make a big sweet potato fry. And then <laughs> like, that's just like, I, instead of doing that, actually listening to what they're saying, instead of trying to whitewash it. Um, yeah. So I feel like that's a really important one. And any, yeah, I just, I could go on and on about it all day, but unless we're actually putting the communities first, it's going to really be very difficult to make changes that actually support these communities. Yeah, instead, I could, I feel like it just feeds into the egos of the people that the justice advocates and the healthcare providers. Well intentioned, but yes, maybe well intentioned. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's let's uh, try to hit our last question, which is just to kind of explore a little more this, uh, you know, this idea that there are health disparities um, and how those are exacerbated not to say even created sometimes by this dominant view of weight, as well as all the systems of oppression that support that. So, you know, could we could we talk a little more specifically about what kinds of health disparities we're talking about and how they are perpetuated? And, you know, Kimmy, want to start with you? Yeah, I would love to start. Um, 
Well, one really big one is how we see that the body responds to stress, like the allostatic load. And we, we actually see now that when people experience weight stigma, their body is more likely to um, maybe struggle with glucose regulation, st uh, struggle with um, yeah, keeping lipids at a healthy level. So this could affect cholesterol panels, blood pressure, and have such an impact just on that very physiological level. But we're also seeing that it affects um, risk for depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, um, your likelihood to engage in physical activity or eat in a way that's disordered or not. Uh, let's see, yeah, avoiding healthcare, it actually increases the risk of mortality by I believe it's 60%. So there are so many health effects and I cannot emphasize this enough. Even if we didn't know all of this, it's still wrong, right? Like it's still so wrong. And in reality, if we were having this talk, like what, 15 years ago, I wouldn't have much, much research to pull from. A lot of this research is very new, but fat activists have been saying this, like what, since the 60s? And, and yeah, so it's just the fact that we have this research now to refer to um, doesn't mean that it's a more serious issue now. It's, yeah, we shouldn't have to wait for the research to show up before we start making changes. Thank you. Mikey? Yeah, I, Kimmy gave a really good review of some of the, the most well-mentioned like forms of disparities. I think about that 60% statistic a whole lot, um, especially um, thinking in the context of like public health, we'll never really know what the health outcomes of fat people could look like in a world without weight stigma until we have a world without weight stigma because weight stigma literally confounds every single study that we could ever do with regards to weight and fat. Um, I think some of the, I honestly think that a lot of the health disparities, things like increased risk for depression, um, things like eating disorders, things like just like general higher allostatic stress load, difficulties with ugh, hormone regulation, um, all of these things are medically created. Um, <laughs> I mean, my, I, I, I feel compelled to always remind people that, you know, it's not just that fat people get sicker and then, so we die sooner. It's that we're, let's say we start off not sick. And then we go to the doctor with a concern and then they ignore us. And then that builds over a lifetime and snowballs into a whole host of issues. And then when we die, instead of pointing to that system that essentially sent us into a, into a well-being spiral, our death is attributed to our fatness. Our death is labeled as obesity. And then that data gets used in in a simplistic regression analysis by some PhD student who's like trying to get a degree. And then they publish a paper and then everybody's like, see, this is what we said, that fat kills you. And it's like, it, it's literally not possible to actually understand how weight stigma, fatness or anything impacts the health of fat people to, to a complex nuance and fully illustrative extent until we have a world without weight stigma like those, like that has to happen before. Um, and I think it's just really important to mention because when we talk about weight stigma as a driver of health disparities, it's like, we just talk about it as if it's just sort of like amorphous and in the air. And to an extent, stigma is something that's ambient. It's all over us. It impacts how people look at us, the, whether or not there's there's accessible built environments on the outside, whether or not we can get on public transportation and be comfortable, that just, it affects everything. And so it is everywhere, but it doesn't just exist. It doesn't just appear. It's something that's driven by processes that often involve people that are supposed to be advocating for our health. And so when we die and then they attribute our deaths to obesity, the cycle continues and it perpetuates. Um, and people are allowed to, to shirk off the blame that they potentially have in the deaths that they've caused because the death was attributed to obesity. 
and not to the fat phobic system that killed them. Um, yeah, and I also think I've I've started to get really interested, and this is a bit of a niche example, but I've started to get really interested in research that discusses how people who receive um, like food stamps, their be their eating behavior changes over the course of like their benefit cycle, and so if people are restricting because they're reaching the end of the month and they don't have money to buy food. And we think about how fat people are both paid less, less likely to get hired and generally have a lower socioeconomic status and access to resources that allow people to eat steadily. Then if we're thinking about that and poverty and fat phobia, how much disordered eating and eating disorders is that accountable for? that we have no idea and have no way of measuring because researchers in general don't care and funding institutions that fund that research don't give a shit. <laughs> and, and this is all due to fat stigma, white supremacy and healthism and individualization, which I mean, individualism, which Holly mentioned earlier. And I think it's a really, really important point because individualism is how we justify killing fat people <laughs> a lot of the time and blame them for it so yes. and when and when when you know the old saying when you're a hammer everything looks like a nail when you're it, it's been in this culture that when you're in the healthcare professions you know everything gets blamed on obesity i'm thinking about the um the so-called obesity paradox right which is like, um, yeah, I know we could talk about that for an hour, but you know, for those of you who don't know, it's this idea that like, we assume that certain kinds of chronic health conditions like type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, we assume that they are the, the result of fatness among other risk factors, but primarily fatness. Um, and yet some people who are in larger bodies actually do better with those chronic health conditions. They live longer, they get less sick, and so doctors, you know, researchers have found this over and over again, and they're so puzzled by it that they call it the obesity paradox, which just underlines the assumption that they're making all of the time that, of course, everyone knows fatness will kill you. Except when it doesn't, hmm, then we don't know. We don't know what to do with it. So we call it a paradox. And we continue to recommend weight loss because that's what we do. And we know how to do that. Anyway, Holly, I wanted to give you a chance to speak to this um, notion of health disparities as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, my sort of expertise lies in eating disorders primarily. And so I'll kind of just focus there a little bit. I know that Mikey and Kimmy spoke to, to this a little bit as well. Um, but right to Mikey's point, if somebody is experiencing um, food insecurity and or well, likely both if they're uh, if they're a fat person, the um, the weight stigma and fat phobia at the physician's office. Um, so they, they may be experiencing patterns of restriction um, or other patterns of disordered eating. If they're in a fat body, that often goes unrecognized at the physician's office. So right there is barrier number one, right? That they might not even get um, a referral to resources that could be helpful in helping them um, work through those, those restrictive and disordered patterns with food. Um, if they can get past that barrier, then there's this other whole ripple effect of barriers that they're going to face through the process of treatment. And this is something we're constantly trying to look at as an organization and figure out like, how can we, um, how can we provide support for so many who fall through the gaps, right? Because eating disorders treatment is like, super expensive. So not only can most people not afford it, um, if they can afford it, what kind of care are they going to receive when they're in treatment, right? Are they going to have physicians, therapists who um, are having these kinds of conversations and can, can um, bring some cultural relevancy to those conversations with them and help them dissect not just, again, the individual experience, but what they've experienced systemically and, and culturally and how that's impacted their, you know, where they're at right now. Um, if, if they can move through treatment and then they leave, what's changed in their community, what's changed in their household, what's changed in terms of their access to food. Likely not a lot because again, so much of that emphasis is often placed on the individual. And so, um, you know, I, I don't say all of this to, 
to leave us in a super existential place, but the, right, these are the hard conversations we need to be having um, as community activists, as um, providers, as organizers, to really be looking at, again, not those easy solutions, but how do we solve for these really big barriers? Oh, yeah. well, Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to sort of touch on what Mike mentioned, and I, I feel like Holly, like, yeah, by bringing up eating disorders. Yeah, this cycle that we see throughout the month, um, and especially like for those that might not be aware of what I'm talking about, just as people's been, um, like sort of uh, food stamp, like UET benefits might diminish or the resources might diminish throughout the month, we see that people oftentimes like their eating will change a lot. They're more likely to experience low blood sugar towards the end of the month. We have more people hospitalized for low blood sugar towards the end of the month. And folks that I work with that are in eating disorder recovery that experience food insecurity in some capacity, it has a huge impact on their recovery. It makes it really difficult, especially with folks that struggle with binging and then also face this restriction for part of the month and then sudden rush of benefits. And we have to think of it from an evolutionary perspective, right? If there's suddenly famine, feast, famine, feast, it can be really difficult for our systems and for our mental health. Yeah, well put, well put. <clears throat> and I would add that the, the field of eating disorders as a field is, you know, like all healthcare is, you know, subject to the same stigmas and oppressions that we all are, but my personal experience with eating disorder treatment is that it's highly, highly fat phobic um, for a variety of reasons that we don't need to get into. Okay, well, I think um, I think that is unfortunately that we are out of time because I feel like we could continue this conversation um, for a while, but I think that we are moving on to the next part of the evening. So I will turn this over to Taylor. Avalon, did you want to go first? Yeah, um, just a couple more housekeeping things before Taylor reads us our group norms. Thanks, Taylor. Um, I just, that was fabulous. That was amazing. Um, if you're like me, you're just like rapid fire taking notes. Um, <laughs> um, and so, yeah, thank you to our moderator and our panelists for that. Um, I just wanted to say a reminder that after Taylor reads us the group norms, we're gonna head into breakout rooms for some community conversation. And then we'll come back to the larger group for some Q and A. And then while Taylor's reading, I'm gonna drop the link to a very, very brief post event survey, which we would love for you all to just like pull up. Like if you just wanna click the link and then come back to the Zoom and take a look at it later um, and fill it out after today's event. But yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you, Taylor. Take it away. Okay. Hi, everyone. So we have a few um, group norms and um, expectations for the conversation that we're going to be having in the breakout rooms, as well as the Q&A with panelists following those breakout rooms. So um, and at the session we held last last week with Holly, we had some brave space discussion about how to, you know, have these conversations and feel safe while doing so. So these are some of those norms as well as SOFSA's group norms. So while this main session is being recorded, the small group conversations are not going to be recorded. So please feel free to talk freely in those and that there is an emotional support person as Maura noted earlier. Um, Instructions to turn on closed captioning were sent earlier and they will be sent again. And if there are any other accommodations that you need to participate more fully in this conversation, please reach out to Avalon or Mora. Um, Self-care for our, <laughs> our breakout room, like Mara mentioned earlier, we do have a um, social worker who's helping with emotional support tonight and snacks and drinks are welcome on screen if you're comfortable. Um, if you're enjoying something special or good or anything local, you know, make feel free to drop that in the chat as well. Um, keep your camera on when you can, turn it off when you need more privacy as well. Um, and we'll be asking everyone to keep their mics off in this larger group portion. So when we come back for the Q and A, um, but in the smaller breakout rooms, please unmute yourself as you're able to. Okay. 
Um, and feel free to use the chat box or use the raise hand function to ask a question. Those on the phone can dial um, star six to unmute themselves to ask questions and be sure to ask questions of presenters and one another to enable opportunities for clarification and to avoid making assumptions. Also, please be mindful to balance your participation. Um, we want to you know, hear from everyone, but also make sure that you're actively listening to others, especially in these small group conversations and make sure everyone has an equal opportunity to share their thoughts, concerns, and questions. Um, we may not get to all the questions or even complete our planned agenda, um, but we'll do our best to ensure, you know, any follow up after the event um, and accept that there might be, your questions might not be answered and there might not be closure to everything, but we will be sending out resources after. Um, we agree to support one another to maintain these guidelines and our work together. If harm is caused, we'll apologize, take accountability, and center the needs of the person who's been harmed. Um, what is discussed in breakout room sessions should stay um, confidential and stay in those breakout room sessions. And please avoid triggering language such as um, specific numbers, oppressive language, or talk of trauma that could be triggering to others. And now we will be going into breakout rooms. So thank you guys so much. And when we come back, we'll be doing the Q&A. So if you have any questions, make sure to hold on to those. So if anyone has any questions that they want um, to ask the panelists, you can either raise your hand and um, or you can put your questions in the chat. Um, questions that are put in the chat, I'll read them out loud. Um, but if you raise your hand, you're more than welcome to also ask your question out loud when it's your turn. Don't be shy. I bet you have a question. Um, hi, everyone. I do have a question. Uh, my name is Kanisha Miller. Um, so I, I'm interested in, in um, learning more about nutrition and maybe uh, more so culturally relevant nutrition ways of cooking, not for professionals, but just for home cooks, um, people who are interested in just nourishing their bodies and just was wondering if anyone had uh, resources or experience uh, with that. Um, yeah, oh gosh. So the first thing I would start with is even like what we consider nourishing. It can sometimes be influenced by diet culture. And so I feel like I would honestly like learn more from like chefs and culinary experts about like how to cook in a way that feels fun and right. And when it comes to some of the like nutrition guidance, maybe like around health concerns, there's a book that recently came out. Um, it's called Gentle Nutrition. I think that's people. Yeah, Gentle Nutrition by Rachel Hartley. And like this is a white dietitian, so I add that with a, for a lot of reasons. But one is that like um, I appreciate the way she presents like cooking from kind of like a fun perspective, but also mentions how like nutrition is only one small part of health that it's not it's only relevant under certain contexts. And yeah, so that can be a nice juice to start. Thank you. Someone I really love, and you may already know of this person because they have a very large following on Instagram, but um, Dr. Kara Niamdio, she goes by black.nutritionist. Um, and 
she has a you know like emailing list and she's honestly one of my one of my favorite black nutritionists on instagram who is always discussing how you can how you don't have to distance yourself from your cultural foods in order to you know have nutritious meals and so absolutely she would be my first choice and also um let me think probably also a hmm. probably also somebody like alicia mccullough who's on instagram as well um she goes by black and embodied and yeah i know that she has like a lot of connections to different black nutritionists especially who are doing a lot of vital work um with regards to eating disorders and nutrition and just like honoring culture, cultural traditions within black communities too. And so I, I love both of them a whole lot. Wonderful, thank you. Kayla, you can go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Kayla Doyle. Um, this is a really fantastic conversation and, and thank you so much to um, the panelists for, for um, the discussion and sharing your thoughts. Um, I am uh, currently studying marriage and family therapy and one of the um, things that we study as marriage and family therapists are looking at, um, we're always putting the family in the context of other systems. and. Um, my question for the panelists would be um, knowing that we keep, you know, things like patterns and transgenerational patterns in mind for families in terms of um, replication of, of certain uh, uh, ways of living, ways of eating, and then also knowing that we always want to focus on the family and the person as their own expert what are or what would be hypothetically some of the questions that you would ask families if you were um, a marriage and family therapist or a therapist provider given the conversation here tonight i always like to so i work with families um, sometimes like in the nutrition realm and a lot of times i'll ask like what the household culture is around health and food and what, yeah, sort of like how that's discussed. And a lot of times if there is one person in the family, like a parent that might struggle in their relationship with food, it can be a really dominant force and really dictate what's like accepted in the family. So that's something I try to keep an, up, keep an eye out for. Um. I haven't done too much work with around like family specifically, but I do think a lot about the intergenerational passage of disordered eating behaviors. Um, because I think especially within my family, um, and, and for anybody here who, who might be able to relate, specifically like my family is Dominican and Haitian. And so our sort of there's this idea that black people don't have eating disorders or don't struggle with weight stigma there's a lot of weird conflations within the literature on this a lot of it is just because a lot of the research is done by white researchers who don't actually know what questions to ask um but <laughs> i didn't realize that it, it wasn't normal to like not only eat to like to to not to to only eat like one big meal a day like I didn't know that that wasn't normal until I became acquainted with the ways that other people eat and the idea that I should restrict 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 and then save all those calories for like my one meal when I get at home when I get home that was something that like my mom taught me <laughs> that she passed down to me and my sister. That was something that she internalized on lots of several, lots of different occasions from her mother who got it from her mother. Um, and so I want to emphasize specifically that like 
for a lot of different cultures, they might not understand that certain certain relationships to foods are actively detrimental to them um, because they're normalized and we just don't talk about them. Um, and so something as simple as like, how many times a day do you eat? Who is in charge of preparing like foods? If you were in a, in a household like mine, um, my sister was the one who was preparing meals a lot of the time um, because my mother was always working. And so that's the kind of experience where like there's multiple people who might be in charge of the nutritional, I don't know, fabric of a household. And that deviates from like the standard nuclear family that we have in our minds. And so it's important to like think about the specific dynamics within each family and how those then might feed into or help prop up certain forms of disordered eating. Um, and so that's just ask everything. <laughs> how many times a day do you eat? What do you eat? How do you feel? You know, what, what is your, what is your dinner set up? I specifically had a lot of anxiety around dinners when I was younger and it was because it was the time of day where I was eating the most. And for fat people, that can be really distressing, especially when you are really used to your body being policed all the time and people assuming that you are over consuming all the time. Um, and that can be something that, you know, is encouraged and promoted within the family structure. And so it's, it's worth diving into, I think, personally. Um, I'll add that a couple of things that are coming up for me as I'm even just listening to Kimmy and Mikey are like, um, one, especially with um, parents who call looking for resources for their children, um, it's tricky, right? Because on one hand, parents do hold so much responsibility for supporting a child through recovery and in, in the case of eating disorders, um, but oftentimes, as stated, right, parents often have a lot of their own disordered eating stuff and their own transgenerational um, habits, trauma that have been passed down that they're still carrying. And so one of the things um, that I, I invite, it doesn't always work, but I invite parents and caregivers to think about is how are you resourcing yourself through this so that you can be a better resource for your child or your, your loved one who you're trying to support? Um, like, what does that actually look like for you? Because you're gonna do just as much work in this. It's gonna look different, but, but it's a lot of work. Um, and then, uh, oh shoot, I'm gonna lose my train of thought. Excuse me, I still have new mom brain. Um, what was the other thing I was thinking of? Oh, it'll come back to me and, and I'll chime in. But um, yeah, how are you resourcing yourself? Oh, I know what it was. Um, in terms of talking about food and the ways that we talk about food as families, um, even just inviting them to think about how do they do that? Do we talk about it in terms of tradition? Do we talk about it only in terms of health or dieting? Do we talk about it in terms of like relationship building and having fun and enjoying each other's company? Um, just starting to kind of look at that. And, and then the next step, right? Looking for ways to nurture um, the, that relationship with food that isn't about health, isn't about calories, isn't about diet, um, and can kind of build up these other ways of being with food and with our bodies. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. So um, I'm not sure. I didn't see anyone else raising their hand or any questions in the chat. So I kind of had a question. Um, you know, earlier we were talking about in the panel how, you know, a lot of um, primary care doctors. Oh, there is one. Why can't I see it? Okay. So I do have a question in the chat. Um, are there beneficial resources available surrounding food or nutritional needs of those with mental health diagnosis? Um, just to make sure I'm understanding correctly, um, if the person is asking if certain foods can impact someone's mental health, generally I find that the biggest impact is really like if somebody is eating regularly and if they're eating enough, I think that like there's some research on omega-3s and depression, but aside from that, it's actually not something that's very well studied, like on, yeah, 
on more of a like nutrient response type of thing. A lot of that research is also not particularly well done. Um, nutritional nutrition research is like such a controversial and hotly contested area of research because of just the sheer number of confounders <laughs> that come into play just from like a research design standpoint. And so, yeah, um, I unfortunately don't have any research that I would recommend um, regarding like the potential impact of certain foods or nutrients on mental health diagnosis because a lot of the time it's not actually that specific food. It's just the fact that like Kimmy said, people are eating and it's really hard to eat consistently and sustainably when you are also struggling with a mental health issue. Thank you. And Cassandra asked that um, question. So um, if you wanted to clarify anything, Cassandra, feel free to like write that in the chat and I can ask that again to the panelists. Um, but a question that I had, you know, you were talking earlier about how a lot of times like primary care doctors don't have a ton of knowledge about nutrition. But of course, <clears throat> you know, I've also met a lot of nutritionists who do have, you know, some of these like weight stigmas as well, too. So, you know, in the fields that you all work in, how do you kind of um, communicate what you know about weight to them, um, because it's kind of different, right? You both have maybe a degree in nutrition or a degree in public health, and you're all working on similar things, but you have a completely different outlook on weight. Like, how do you balance that in your work? Are we talking about in the scenario in which we're like seeking services from somebody or? Um, I was thinking more so like along the lines of people maybe that you work with or other um, people who provide similar services that you do. Mm. So as I mean, Kimmy, do you want to go first or? Oh, you go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yeah. I was just going to say for for me, um, it is against my fundamental ethos to work with people who don't respect or value fat people. Um, there's no reason why. I would, I, I respect that sort of introductory work where like, you know, the handholding and the explaining of like, hey, that's actually kind of fucked up to say. Like, I, I value the hell out of that work. Um, it's not my ministry though, so I don't do it. Um, especially since because I am a fat black person who has experienced plenty of medical trauma in my life. And so I'm not going to waste any more time trying to explain to a potential collaborator why they should have respect for me and people who look like me. Um, that's, to, that's to say um, that when it comes to weight stigmatizing beliefs within like people in my department, especially um, at the Brown School of Public Health, um, I find that when people have a direct financial investment in maintaining quote unquote obesity prevention paradigms, they're not exactly that interested in whether or not what they're saying is weight stigmatizing. Um, and I've learned the hard way that not everyone is your ally. And that sucks. <laughs> but that's just sort of the unfortunate truth. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't offer something more substantive for you personally. No, thank you. <laughs> um, something that I, I feel like there's two sort of camps with folks, like one is maybe like random health providers that are doing fat public things. And like, if they're attending a talk of mine, then we discuss it, but I'm not, yeah, I'm not necessarily like, putting out the emotional energy I have to educate them. But when it comes to like my clients, providers that are saying fat phobic things about my clients to be on the phone, not knowing that I'm a fat person, then it's really important that I name that moment. Well, actually I'm also fat and X, Y, and Z is why this is incorrect. And I find that immediacy can be really helpful in naming it in that moment. 
Um, and if they're not really familiar with my work or my approach, I usually send them some information. I kind of have like, um, like an email template that I send them just because like if they want to consult with me, I have a fee for that. Like it's not something that I can put forth the emotional labor with like every single time I have a phone call with a provider. So I find that it, it really just depends on what their own personal bias is. Like some folks are more open to learning and some aren't. So it's yeah, case by case basis. I'll add to that. It's it is definitely case by case. Um, you know, at, at, in our throughout our history as an organization, we've been asked to do a number of different speaking educational events, um, and a lot of times it's to providers, nurses, etc. And, and you know, what I find a lot of times is the person who's organizing that feels really strongly about this information, but getting anybody else at the event to like get on board is really hard. And so one of the sort of really difficult things we've had to grapple with as, as an organization, and specifically in my role, as somebody who doesn't face that same stigma, and I can be an ally and advocate for this information in a way that doesn't cause direct harm to myself, um, I do feel that that's a responsibility. And there's a responsibility to be really purposeful with like the time and energy we're spending doing this work. And so one of the things that we've we're continuing to look at is sort of taking the approach, like sort of the backdoor approach of like, how can we educate our community, our communities, so that they have the tools and resources to feel um, more, more um, capable of advocating for themselves and or having other community members advocate with them. Um, because a lot of times kind of speaking to that immediacy piece that Kimmy was, was um, alluding to is that direct conversation between provider and, and patient or client probably is going to have a bigger impact than like me telling them all these things that they think they know more about. Um, and so, yeah, a little bit of a backdoor approach, but um, that's, that's why we've shifted our efforts to try and educate the people who this is impacting um, so that they have more tools within them. Do we have time for another question? Can I ask a question? Um, is that okay, Taylor? Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, I just think this is such an important question, uh, conversation. I don't think it's an important question. I think it's an important conversation. I'm so grateful to the panelists and I'm looking forward to seeing how this continues with SOFSA. Um, I just think I uh, wanted to hear if you have examples of either like metrics, like in the research context, or examples, not to just put research at the top of the, the hierarchy there, that are inspiring you, that are integrating food justice and fat liberation right now, um, that, yeah, we can like look towards and learn from. In food justice, not so much, um, which is sad. Um, I recently had like a really good um, interaction with specifically um, Food Share Toronto. And I think that they're like doing lots of cool organizational work to sort of unpack biases within the, within their like own, you know, organization that they can then use to do transformative work there's like a lot of stuff you have to actually do before you get to the point where like you have a team that is committed to not stigmatizing the community that they're you know working with there's a lot of re-education that has to happen um with regards to weight stigma though i've sang this person's praises time and time and again um Rachel Fox is working on some of the most interesting weight stigma interventions for healthcare providers, period. Um, when Holly said the word backdoor, I was reminded of how Rachel sort of is like working on this very interesting project right now um, with a group of medical students um, in San Diego that sort of avoids the issue of how medical providers specifically or medical students can um, 
like do like nutrition counseling in a non-stigmatizing way. She's just like taking that off the plate completely. She's like, you should not be doing that because you don't know what that is and you are not trained. And also avoiding the, the, the like huge overarching issue of having to like do that re-education by just telling them to not do certain things. It's like, do less instead of do things in a different way. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and I also think it's really effective because a lot, I think a lot of the sort of weird tension, especially within healthcare, um, that providers who want to do better, you know, ostensibly sort of express is that they're like, okay, well, how do I do this in a different way? That's not stigmatizing. And I'm like, well, you can't. So stop doing it. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting way of sort of getting around how do we do these things in a different way? Maybe we just sort of consider like that not everyone should do everything because not everyone can. And I think that's, a, that's an interesting way of approaching the conversation. And Rachel is the one who um, just like really has inspired me in that way. And so, yeah, back doors are cool. All kinds of back doors. Back doors are great. We need back doors. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Amanda, did you have a question? Um, we have yeah, I mean, if, if it's possible that I can ask, I think this ends at 730. Is that right? Yeah, it does. But um. If it's a yes. quick question, I think that that's fine. But after that, we cool. do have to end, unfortunately. Um, I feel like I should give myself a high five with that in the corner of the screen. Um, anyway, so I work in food insecurity work. And what I noticed there is that policy is incredibly restrictive if you're working under specifically federal funds. And research is also often aligned with those kind of funding sources or in the charitable food space, you always are vying for charity. Um, and we always, where I work, we would like want to demolish that system and reshape it. I guess backdoors is like a theme. My question is in the space of like fat liberation and health at every size, wherever you, where you lie in that spectrum, do you see faces changing policy? And what, who are those faces and what even does that policy look like? Because I know it's important in our space in community work to reshape it. I, I just am clueless as to who's reshaping it for you guys. Yes, I know that like Shavise Turner, um, Shavise is like a lay person that has done a lot of really great advocacy work and works with health or has done some work in policy. Um, I think she's involved in maybe, um, like making it illegal to um, discriminate based on weight and height. Oftentimes in policy, the two will go hand in hand, weight and height. But um, yeah, so I think she's someone who's done a lot. I think there's a lawyer on the West Coast that was like involved in making it illegal in Washington state, if I'm remembering correctly. I'm forgetting, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but yeah, people are doing that work. It's not my bag. That's why I don't like know all the deeds offhand. But yeah, there are some great folks doing that. There's, there was a similar effort recently um, in Massachusetts with a bunch of folks um, in collaboration with the Striped Center at Harvard, but I did not appreciate that effort and here is why. Um, they actually had a bunch of extremely harmful collaborators, one of which being the Rudd Center at UConn. Um, which is notorious for being horrible to fat people under the guise of doing weight stigma research. And so when I think of like policy, um, I don't actually have that much hope for it as a driver of change. Like, cause if we're talking about specifically within the food space, I think people do too much focus on like, oh, well, what about like changing the face of subsidies and like, different grant money and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, if the hoops that we have to jump through in order to get those opportunities are wrought with the same hierarchies that already exist, they're not actually doing anything. Um, 
And so that's why a lot of like my work presently has sort of been restricted to the mutual aid space because like things like community fridges and like pantries um, because I mean, if we're going like every single initiative that I've seen in New York state specifically to like end food deserts or whatever is inherently tied to obesity prevention efforts. There's like no, there's no will to parse out the two things. Um, and so I don't know, it, the space doesn't seem that really bright to me. Um, but if I'm, if we're talking about policies that I think are important in order for food justice to occur, then that means that people need to have stable access to funding whenever they need it in order to buy food and stable access to healthcare and childcare subsidies and education and blah, blah, blah. Like the same things that people are always rallying for, all roads lead back to there. People need the resources they need in order to thrive. And there's no way we can get around that by doing like stopgap measures, like increase subsidies for healthier foods or increase funding for organic farms that give food to certain school districts. Like none of that shit is going to make any kind of difference. None of it <laughs> because it's already occurred and it still hasn't made a difference and people just keep doing the same thing. Um, yeah, I see policy as more of an obstacle to the issue of food justice than than a facilitator but that's me and i think that that's influenced by both how i've seen policy operate in public health spaces in particular as something that is incredibly neoliberal and not actually that revolutionary um and so i and i see that same kind of issue show up in food justice spaces in particular well thank you all so much um it was amazing hearing from all of all three of you and also Professor Brown. Um, so if you all were a participant, there is a post event survey in the chat um, that we encourage you to fill out. Um, but other than that, thank you all so much again. And I hope you enjoyed and have a great night. Bye everyone, thank you.